Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, sir, this morning we have Mr. Finch and Mr. Coleman. Yes, um, but I think before we call some evidence, uh, I propose to say something about um, a sad death which has occurred uh, quite recently. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> as I've already indicated, it's my sad duty to announce that on the 10th of May, so last Wednesday, Mrs. Veronica May passed away in hospital. Mrs. May was the wife of a former sub-postmaster, Mr. Francis May, who is a co-participant in the inquiry represented by How and Co. And as I understand it, one of their clients who has taken a very keen interest in the work of the inquiry. Mrs. May was aged 67. She had suffered ill health over some years. Despite that, she had, been, she had provided very significant support to Mr. May in relation to his claims compensation, both in relation to the group litigation and in his communications with his solicitors at this inquiry. On behalf of the whole inquiry team, and on my own behalf, I extend our deepest sympathies to Mr. May and family and friends of Mrs. May. As I've indicated, Mr. May was a claimant in the group litigation, and he has made a claim for further compensation in the group litigation scheme. My understanding of the current position is that he has received an interim payment, but that at least some of that payment was immediately paid over to his trustee in bankruptcy. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so Mr. Finch will be giving evidence first. His evidence will be quite brief, but we will be taking a short break uh, in order to arrange uh, for Mr. Coleman to come into the room and of to course. make other arrangements. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm going to begin by calling Mr. Finch. I swear by mighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Can you, can you give your full name, please? Alvin Edwin Finch. Uh, Mr. Finch, you should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 10th of March, 2023. Yes. Yes. Um, if I could ask you to look at that statement and turn to the final page, page six of six, is that your signature? That is. Yes. And can you confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Thank you very much, Mr. Finch. As I've said, um, your evidence is going to be quite brief today. Uh, thank you very much for attending the inquiry to give that evidence. By way of background, you joined Fujitsu's SSC in about 2004, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And you only worked there for a few months. Yes. Yes. Um, what was the nature of your job over those few months? Well, it, it, I was uh, in training to, uh, to go forward and do further uh, su uh, support work there. So I was um, going around different sections, picking up the fr different details from different parts of the system, whether it be hardware or software. And in those four month, few months, um, what do you recall of the approach taken to fixing bugs, errors, and defects in Horizon? Well, I didn't get to, f to actually fixing anything myself, um, it, but some of the, um, well, the system struck me as, as odd in that uh, when, they, when the hardware came in, they, they, it, was so, it was so locked out, they had to use hacking tools to get into it. Um, and there was one particular fellow who was going through some of the overnight comms stuff where it's, it's, it seemed like the, the, where these overnight comms were happening, uh, he got some tools. Um, unfortunately, I fell out with this fellow, and I, I'm trying to remember the rest of it. But it, I mean, at the time, the, the way I was doing, or the way he, was, he got these things organised to fix comms problems reminded me a bit of my time at Marconi with paper tape, where you're fixing a parity problem rather than fixing the, the actual problem that was there. But it, it, it kind of felt like that, and people were rushing to get things done within the system. 
Um, if I could just stop you there. Sorry, sorry. When you refer to overnight comms, that, that's, is that phone calls from the... Uh, well, in the, the, <coughs> the way the system was communicating across the network. Uh, I'm very hazy about what, what, what particular bit was there. I remember there was, there was a couple of different computer systems there. And there was error reports coming up where that, that had to be kind of sorted out af afterwards. But uh, I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> that, that's fine. The analogy you've used is putting pieces of paper over a problem. Is that? Um, well, it, <coughs> you, once upon a time, when I was at Marconi, everything was paper tape. And the, when, it, when you read a paper tape through the system, occasionally it was stall. And you'd get a, a junior program and go, oh, just parity error again. Punch a hole in there to put put the parity right. Well, that was that was wrong. You need to go back and look at the to see what character should be there to make sure you got the right character back. You could fix the the symptom, but not the not the problem. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take you to two passages in your witness statement and just see if you were able to expand on that. Right. Um, could I ask you, you? You do speak quite quickly. If you're able to um, slow down for the purpose of the transcriber, that would be very okay, helpful. Sorry. Thank you. Um, it's paragraph 29 of your witness statement. Um, that is WITN 08060100. And it's page five of that document. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's, it's been brought up on screen. You say, I've been asked if I ever felt under pressure to avoid finding bugs, errors, and defects in the Horizon IT software. It certainly seemed like that. The approach was to keep everything going rather than reporting back. There seemed to be pressure to get a fix in and keep going. Um, are you able to expand on that at all? Um, well, it's certainly, certainly there were some sort of like rah-rah meetings where the, we, would, we were told about the, the huge pressure that was on for Jitsu to keep this going and the, the thousands or millions that could be lost if we weren't keeping, keeping the, uh, the job up to scratch and that, that, that we, we needed to be maybe working all hours to keep the, keep the thing going and avoid any, um, any, any kind of penalty clauses. We heard from Mick Peach yesterday, um, and he said that the generation of code fixes wasn't visible to somebody at your level. Um, are you, do you have any comments on that at all? Well, I, didn't read, I didn't really see any, 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 any code that would be dealt with elsewhere. I was looking at the, the uh, general overall workings of the system, system functions rather than actual, actual code. Would you be able to comment on uh, longer-term plans from Fujitsu to correct bugs, errors, and defects? No, I mean, it's only there a few months. So. Um, uh, and from the position that you were in, it was your view that there was pressure to get a fix and keep going? Yes. Um, moving on to paragraph 30, just below, you say, I've been asked whether any pressure was placed upon me or colleagues not to pass information to post office in relation to potential bugs, errors, and defects within the Horizon IT system. Um, I don't know, but the protocol was uh, that we kept it confidential within the system. Can you, can you help us with what you mean there by the protocol? Um, well, it, it felt a bit like the Official Secrets Act, where you don't, you don't pass anything on to say anything to any, any customer or mention anything to anybody within the post office. Not that I would, not that I would, I would at that time come into contact with anybody, anybody in the post office, but not to communicate any, any sort of anything inside the company to the, uh, any post office employees. And where was that coming from? <sighs> was it a culture? Was it an individual? It's, yeah, I would say it was, it was um, a culture, really. And did anyone ever say anything to you in that respect, or was it just a feeling that you had? Um, well, there's one guy in particular that I fell out with. It, it, there was, that was pressure from him in particular. Um, I think possibly he was very pressured himself. So, so. Do you remember his name at all? No. Um, and what did he tell you about keeping things confidential? Uh, just by basically what it says there that we do, nothing goes out of the out of the building and can you tell us why you left the SSC um, there was one particular person I felt uh, that, that um, I had sort of arguments with him about how things were were fixed 
in, in a way, or say arguments, discussions. Um, there's possibly a personality clash as well. Um, and the whole, the culture just didn't feel right to me. Um, the, <laughs> some of the people I went round, I'm, I'm, I'm like, who were fixing different bits of the system, seemed to me a little, little, like, little bit like te technological dinosaurs. I mean, the rest of the world was kind of emerging into, into new systems. And we were back, I mean, that was back in X25. Everything then was moving forwards to TCP IP, et cetera. It was, it, I don't know, it just, there didn't seem to be um, a feeling of any, any innovation going on somehow. Thank you, Mr. Finch. Uh, I said I'll be brief. Those are all of my questions. I don't believe that anybody has any other questions. Um, so thank you very much for coming to give your evidence. Thank you. Mr. Finch, I too want to thank you for making a witness statement and, to come to, and for coming to give evidence. It was short and sweet, but nonetheless, it touched upon matters which we are considering with care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So can we take a 10-minute break? Yeah. Uh, and then we'll bring Mr. Coleman in. All right. So that's... Um, 10 well, to... 10 to, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Can I please call Mr. Coleman? Yes, of course. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Can you give your full name, please? Yeah, Richard Ian Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. Um, you should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 16th of March 2023. I do, yeah. Can I ask you to have a look at the final page, page 11? Yep. And can you confirm that that's your, your signature? It is, yes. And can you confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Coleman, for coming to give your evidence today. Um, I'm going to start by asking you a little bit about your background. You joined ICL in 1990, is that right? Uh, yes. And you worked as a hardware engineer until June 1998? Correct, yes. And then you transferred to the SSC and worked there until 2005, is that right? Yeah. Thank you. And you worked under Mick Peach, who we heard from yesterday, is that right? Yes. Uh, and then after leaving Fujitsu, you trained to become a Minister of Religion in the Church of England. I did. Uh, and that's the role that you currently... It is, yes. I'm going to ask you about your role in the SSC. Can you briefly tell us what that role involved? Uh, I was just a, a technician, so um, calls would come in from post, postmasters uh, and... Uh, other sort of systems that we had, uh, so calls would be raised, uh, and we would, I would then sort of uh, investigate those, um, and then if there was a, a software error, uh, send that on to development for them to sort of fix, uh, and then yeah. So I would, I, my role was sort of gathering the evidence required uh, to determine that, and then to sort of try and fix it. Did you have a particular area of focus? Uh, yes, mine were, um, there were two databases uh, to do with the configuration of um, the post office and the counters, so ACDB and uh, OCMS, I think it was, um, so they were my particular areas of responsibility. Barbara Longley's evidence was that different people had different interests, is that right? Yes, so one of the things that Mick wanted was for to sort of have... Uh, people who have particular responsibilities for the different areas, different systems that we had, uh, and then for so you would become the sort of expert on that particular area, uh, and then it was down to you to sort of uh, spread that knowledge within the SSC so that all everybody could um, at least handle any call that came into the SSC. Were there formal ways of doing that spreading of knowledge, or was it more informal? Um, I mean, I, I suppose the formal ways would be um, we would be required to write documentation for the SSC to use. Um, so, I mean, I can recall writing stuff 
uh, documentation on uh, the ACDB, for example, uh, detailing how it worked, um, what to do if we couldn't use the automated systems. So the, so the ACDB would generate um, various files overnight at different times, uh, and they would then be processed by other systems. So if we couldn't use the automated systems, it would be down to us to sort of create those files manually for whatever reason, uh, and for, the, for them to be then processed by other systems as, as required. So there was formal documentation uh, in that regard, um, but it was also a case of just um, mentoring other people within the SSC uh, on those systems. So um, part of my role, there was uh, a daily, there were daily job, so I had a daily job that I had to do uh, each morning uh, to checking the output of the ACDB and OCMS, see whether there's any, any errors, um, and if there were to sort of then sort those out. Um, so I trained, well, I don't know, a handful of people uh, on being able to do that role as well. So when I'm on holiday or sick or whatever, um, you know, they could then take over. I want to look at one part of your witness statement. That's WITN 06470100. Um, thank you. Can we turn to page 7, paragraph 22? About halfway down that paragraph, you say, um, I do not recall being involved in the investigation of calls to do with the branch accounts, as there were others, such as Ann Chambers and John Simpkins, who tended to handle those types of calls. Can you tell us why uh, they were chosen, or, or why, in your view, they were the ones who were handling those types of calls? Uh, I think Anne joined after I had. Um, but John had been there for a number of years before I joined. So he, he was one of the people that sort of I would go to. So if I, if I had something that I didn't quite understand, wasn't sure what was going on, um, John was one of the people that I would have gone to for, you know, what do you think kind of thing. We'd have a conversation about that. Um, and Anne seemed to just get into this sort of EPOS type calls. Um, so that would, again, so she, whether, whether Mick had given her that responsibility as sort of, that would be her area of expertise or not, I don't know, but she was, she would be one of the people that, yeah, again, I would, if I got an EPOS call, um, it would be, yeah, probably Anne or perhaps Diane, she was another one um, that I would have gone to for that. Can you give Diane's full name? Uh, Dan Rowe. Thank you very much. Um, another name that will come across in due course is Gareth Jenkins. Um, can you tell us um, what kinds of issues you may have discussed with Gareth Jenkins? Uh, I'm not aware of discussing anything with Gareth. Um, I think I simply understood that he was just part of the development team. And so when you see yourself and Mr Jenkins on a log, on a pinnacle or a peak, for example, um, you wouldn't have had direct discussions. That would just be entries on the log, would it? Or did you? As, as, far, as far as yes, as far as I can recall, um, I don't recall ever speaking to Gareth personally about an issue. So. And what did you understand about his particular expertise? Uh, I didn't. I just thought he was just part of the development team. Thank you. Um, can we look at poll zero 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 two nine zero one two, please? This is a witness statement from the Bates and others. Um, litigation, and it's page 13 I'd just like to ask you briefly about. There are a few topics that I'm going to take you to. They're just miscellaneous topics um, yep. in order for you to assist the inquiry with its understanding of your role. Um, it's paragraph 47. We have there a reference to support tools that are used to filter information and present information to technicians in ways that make the support process easier. And there's a reference to a smiley support tool uh, and another tool um, which it said that uh, you were involved in. Can you briefly tell us what those two different tools were aimed at doing and your involvement in them? Um, yeah, I mean, the tool that I wrote um, was uh, called SSC FAD Info. Um, and uh, John, John and I had obviously had about the same time 
um, had the thought of ooh, it probably use, it would be useful to have some sort of graphical application that we could use to extract information um, from the various systems and present it sort of in a single window, uh, yeah, which would obviously help us with diagnosing. Um, so, so there was there was a lot of overlap between our two programs because we developed them at the same time, um, unaware that the other person would, was doing so. Um, and I uh, yes, and I think as Steve says, my tool was ultimately what it did that was perhaps different from John's, uh, and I can't remember what what those things were, but that was then subsumed into um, you know, John's program. So it's just a way, because normally we would access um, the information that we needed on the various systems through a command prompt. Um, so you're having to type actually com long command lines in. So obviously having a, a, an applic a Windows application on your computer um, made it a lot easier to, to see that information all together. And what information was, was it that you were seeing using uh, your tool? Um, what, whatever we could, uh, well, whatever we felt was useful to, to us within the SSC. Um, so there were various databases that held information, um, and so our programs would just construct an, an SQL query to go and extract that information and then present it on the screen. So part of that would be message stores as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take you to another document. This one's going to be slightly out of order. Um, it's FUJ 0003973. I wonder if you can assist us with this because I think it may be related to the tool that you built or it may not be. Um, it's a pinnacle and there's a reconciliation issue. And if we have a look, please, at page three, It's a very early pinnacle, I should say. It's 1999, so before the national rollout. Yeah. If we look at page three, about halfway down, it has your name, and it's um, a large number of entries that say new evidence added, um, and it gives FAD codes. Yeah. And then if we keep on scrolling down, it's page eight. near the bottom, it has reference to evidence deleted and has F FAD codes and all of the entries after that for a, a, an entire page say evidence deleted. And then over the page to page 10 at the top it says emailed John knew it with regard to freeing disk space. Are you able to assist? Is that linked to the tool? Is it something else? Um, are you able to put it in um, as simple terms as possible what the issue is there? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So I, I would probably have used um, my SSC FAD info program um, to extract the message stores for all of those FAD codes listed. Um, they would be uh, compressed into a zip file, um, and then I would simply have added them on, onto the call, as you saw on was it page four, I think. And uh, where it says it deleted. Yeah. Um, evidence deleted. Can you tell us what that means, and is that anything we should be concerned about? Uh, if you scroll up a page, back to page eight. Um, uh, so, 1540, I've put an entry saying that once closure has been agreed, then we will delete those files. Uh, I don't recall who John knew it was. Um, but I think that the only reason we wouldn't have kept those, that we've deleted them, was that um, they would take up an awful lot of space, even as compressed zip files. Um, so hence, hence my note there about, so he can free up the disk space on his server. So as I said, I don't know what server that would have been. Um, but we wouldn't need to keep those, and I suspect probably it's taking up space within the Pinnacle system. Uh, and as I say, there'd have been large files, and we wouldn't need to actually keep them with the Pinnacle call, because if we needed to go back to those FAD codes and 
get that evidence again, then we just go back to that fact code and get, extract it from the message store. So, so typically, what would it be that is being deleted from the pinnacle here? It would be the zip files um, that we were... Uh, so, of the, so, so the yeah, zip file of the message store that I would have had attached as, as evidence for um, development uh, and then to give the information to MSU, I think, well, looks of it, uh, for them to uh, uh, let Pockle know whatever they needed to know about those transactions. Um, so, uh, as it says then at 11.50 with John Moran, okay to close as per Martin Box from Pockle. Um, so, you know, once, once the reconciliation has been done, we don't need to keep that evidence with the actual pinnacle itself because it's, it's just taking up dead space on, on that. If I was looking at this some way down the line, would it, that now hinder my ability to understand what's going on? Um, no, because you just go back to the, uh, to the message store and extract the messages again. So it hasn't deleted any messages. All it's done is remove them from the pinnacle, and you'll need to see them both together to properly yes, understand. Yes, yes. Yeah, the messages will be untouched on, on the correspondence servers. Um, thank you. I'm going to take you to a few different pinnacles. I'm going to start with FUJ 00032293, please. This is, again, an early pinnacle. It's from 1999, November 1999, so before the full national rollout. And if we look at the third entry, uh, there's a customer call. He's been experiencing a lot of problems with the system. It has their advice. PM thinks this de um, definitely a system problem and would like it investigated. It's a, a further piece of advice isn't highlighted. It's three rows down. Thank you very much. And if we go over the page, we have Barbara Longley there at 13.19.32 um, saying that this is an EPOS desktop issue. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, she, yeah, she's added the product, EPOS and desktop, yeah. yeah. And then you become involved. Why would you become involved at this stage? Um, we uh, had a had a sort of ad, there, was, there was an admin role that SSC people did. Um, Barbara wasn't technical; she was just just an, I'm sorry, just an administrator. But she she was the administrator. She was she wasn't technical, um, and so we had this role that each person in the SSC would do. So we had a rotor. So each day, one of us would do what we call the pre-scan. So we would um, take a look at the call as it's once Barbara's done her admin on that, uh, and then we could do a bit more admin because we had a sort of technical understanding. Um, so in one of these pinnacles, um, Diane Rowe, as a pre-scanner, sends her call back with insufficient evidence. So you know, she's obviously had a quick look and gone, we haven't got enough evidence. I can see that straight away. So send it straight back. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. So, um, and then, it, it, and then it, because I, I originally, I th when I did my witness statement, originally I thought we did the pre-scan once Barbara had retired. Um, but clearly that's, that's obviously not the case. Um, and I thought, because I thought it was Barbara who would then assign the calls to the various team members. But clearly I'm doing that as the pre-scan. Um, so a pre-scan would, Involve it's, it's, somebody it's a, in the team a, who had better technical knowledge than Barbara Longley, is that right? Yes, yes. So it's a kind of administrative kind of role, yes. but using your technical expertise. Uh, and this sub-postmaster has called in experiencing problems and, and considers that it's a system problem. Yeah. Um, your entry here is defect cause updated to 40 general user. Can you assist us with what that meant? Um, yes, when I, when I looked at this call, when it was sent to me, um, I noticed that and thought, now why have I done that? Not why have I set it to user, but why have I set it at all? 
because a defect cause you can only determine once you've done your investigation. And I haven't done any investigation on this. Uh, I've assigned it to Mike, and he'll do the investigation. So the only thing I can think is that we would have sort of whatever procedure we had for the pre-scan, that um, we had to make sure that possibly every field in Pinnacle had something set to it. Um, so yeah, might and user have been essentially used as a default setting um, in the absence of any other information? I, I, I couldn't say whether that was a default. Um, I'd be very surprised if that was the default. Um, I mean, I, don't, I can't recall what options I would have had under defect cause, um, but I know in one of the other pinnacles, um, somebody had set it to unknown. So if you're going to go for a default, I would have thought it would be something like unknown. Um, so, I mean, as far as I can think that it's a, simply a case of using your best guess, what do you, if you've got to set something, try and set it to something that you think is appropriate. Uh, and in this case, attributing it to user is that that means user error in, in essence. Or well, poten yeah, pot a potential use, user error. Yeah. Thank you. Now, what I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure whether that defect cause gets sent back to Pinnacle. Sorry, Power Help, not Pinnacle. So I think that is a Pinnacle only entry. So it would not have gone back to Power Help. So SMC and HSH, I don't think, would have seen that they would have seen the category that we close it as, which could be very different from what we think the sort of defect cause is. But might the defect cause be um, something that is discussed with those who are communicating directly with the sub-postmasters? It, um, it doesn't have to be in this case, but, but in general, from your, to the best of your recollection, if you had marked something as um, user error, for example, might that have been communicated to uh, the help desk? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if Mike paid any attention to that at this stage, because he's, he's, got to, he's got to investigate, he's got to look and see, yeah, is, is there a system? Yeah, the PM is saying there's a system error, so we need to proceed on that basis. Or, sorry, Mike needs to proceed on that basis. So I doubt he'd have looked at, he'd have paid any attention to that. And he would have, if he, if it, I mean, I know with this call it did turn out to be user error, but if he then thought, well, no, it's not, it's a code error, then he would have changed that when he closed the actual call. And that's so Mike actually was when the... that defect cause comes into effect, if you like, that becomes irrelevant. At the moment, it's sort of irrelevant. Mike was the engineer fixing the issue. Yeah. And he would have seen when he logged onto the system for the first time that that um, defect cause had been attributed to it, whether he, he oh, read yes, something yes, he, into it or not. So yes, he was seen that, yes. yes. Yeah. Can we go to page four, please? Thank you. About halfway down this page, um, you have information there. I've spoken to the PM who is still having problems with his cash account, a shortage of £70,000 this week, um, continuing investigation. And if we look lower down on that page, repeat call, caller has rung back, he's very agitated as he keeps having problems with the system when balancing. He thinks it's a system problem, um, voice to Barbara Longley. If we go over the page, please. Sorry, if, it, um, if I could stay on page four, the, one, the words that I didn't read out there uh, was repeat call. Caller has rung back. He's very agitated. He's rung back. He's very agitated as he keeps having problems with the system. Um, can you assist us at all? Um, did you get a sense working on the um, SSC that, uh, of the human impact that these kinds of issues were having on, on users, customers? 
Um, uh, yes, because obviously when, when you ring the PM, um, yeah, one of the things that they, you know, they, they want, they, or they need their system, their cash account to balance. And if it's not, then um, yes. So yeah, we, we would be aware that you know, the postmasters were getting stressed you know, by using the system and it's not doing what, what they felt it should be doing or giving them the information that, that they thought should be there. Uh, and how common was that? And was that uh, a daily occurrence where um, users were getting stressed uh, weekly? I don't know. I couldn't answer that. If we go over the page, again, this is 1999, so the early days of Horizon. MBSC have stated there are no... Uh, that's Horizon Field Support Officers available to help this PM. At present, he doesn't have enough knowledge of the system for the SSC uh, HSH to advise him. He requires on-site training, and until this is provided by Paul, SSC are unable to help him. Um, this brings us back to really where we started in this phase. Uh, did, did you have any concerns about the training that was provided to sub-postmasters? Uh, nothing to do with the training for the post office. So I have no idea what, what training they received. But having received calls like this or read logs like this, did you have at the time any concerns about the training? Uh, not, not that I recall. Can we please look at FUJ 00072297, please? This is another early log. This time it, it's written in a peak, and, and that's in August 2000. The issue that's raised here is a receipts and payments mismatch. And if we can look at the first entry, please. It describes the issue. It says that um, there's a receipts total, and it gives a figure, and a payments total, and it gives another figure, and, and there's a difference. Uh, this office earlier raised a query because a transfer for an amount uh, seemed to have gone missing. The amount of the transfer is exactly half the amount of the difference between the receipts and payments. And if we look down, we have Barbara Longley there referring to it as a, in the call summary, as a receipts and payments mismatch. Uh, and then we have again um, yourself at 12.17 and it says the call record has been assigned to the team member, Steve Squires, defect calls updated to 40 general user. Uh, now, again, that's something we saw earlier, the um, reference to something being a, a user error, at least initially. D does that assist you with uh, whether attributing something to a user uh, was effectively used as a default? Or a starting position? No, I think that would, it would just be a case of using my knowledge and experience of the system, um, and I've been what there, is it two years now? Um, but again, you know, the EPOS receipts and payments wasn't my particular area of expertise. Um, so again, I'm just going by, you know, if I've seen a lot of these sort of sort of calls come over. And yeah, they might have been sent back as user. I mean, we, we I thought that that was that was appropriate at the time. So we spoke earlier about particular technicians having particular interests, and you mentioned um, two names in respect of dealing with EPOS issues and uh, balancing issues. Um, if they knew. Um, about something called a, or what was being referred to as a receipts and payments mismatch. How, how would that information have received you, re received by you? Um, or is this an example where it seems it hadn't been received by you because you attributed it to user error? Um, yes, I mean, I mean, I'm aware. I'm aware that there was a bug, which um, I can't remember what what it what it was, whether it was a transfer from between stock units or something like that, and it would cause the amount to double, um, which 
my immediate look at this is, you know, that might be along, along those lines. Um, now, whether, whether I knew that at the time of this call, um, I have no idea. Uh, and had you known about but it? If, if I had, then um, yes, I mean, attributing it to user would be, would be an error on my part. Um, can we look at page four of the same document, please? If we look at the second entry, uh, there's the summary there. There was a short period on live where the EPOS code was out of step with the stop desk transfer code. The EPOS code was still writing um, and it gives some information there. And if we scroll down a bit to John Moran at 1346, please. Uh, thank you. Um, we have that being fixed by uh, a release. I think that is CI 45, uh, and then it's closed. So th it's clear in this case that it was um, something, a, a technical issue, a software issue, that was ultimately fixed by a release. Um, had that information been known to you when you took on the call from the beginning, um, presumably you, you wouldn't have been attributing it to system error. Correct, yes, I would use the you know, software category, whatever um, that would be. I mean, using this as an example, um, does this raise any concerns for you about the sharing of information within the SSC and the ability for at least those who initially take on the calls to understand uh, and correctly attribute the problem? Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, can you see any problem with attributing something to user error in, in terms of the mindset, perhaps, of those who are dealing with the issue? Um, well, I mean, what, what, what I don't know is what the call was, what category was the call closed as because just because I've um, set it as user error as an initial thing um, it's as I said I don't think anybody's going to be paying attention to that until you actually come to close the call and that's that's when that category would then be uh, important but it, it's, it's the first thing that the those who are investigating the matter um, the, the engineers would have seen isn't it I mean, it, it's right above. Um, well, I mean, you'd have seen it, but I, as I said, I, I don't think I ever paid any attention to that field when I was investigating a call. So I would just look at the, I would look at the call details, not what somebody set that particular field to. The only time I'd have looked at that was when I come to actually close the call uh, to see, do I need to change it to something more appropriate? Having seen it referred to by Barbara Longley as a receipts and payments mismatch, though, uh, can, can you assist us with why it might be attributed to user error? No, sorry, I can't. Can we please look at FUJ 00086585? This is a peak that I looked at with Barbara Longley. Um, it's described there in the summary as the PM is having problems rolling the office over. And if we look at the beginning, it says the PM is having problems rolling the office over. There are figures missing from the cash account, uh, which is one person entire work. If we scroll down to about halfway down, on the right-hand side, I think that's all. It says AL1, but I think it's all. All her work is missing from the cash account. When she did a balance snapshot, she was £9,000 over, and all her stock is showing as minus. And if we scroll down, there has, there, there's advice given. This is before. Uh, Barbara Longley's evidence was this advice came from likely the help desk rather than from the SSC. Yes. Um, and it seems as though... If we look, if we scroll down to the bottom, that the initial advice that was given 
to her um, was wrong, according to at least one advisor, um, that she shouldn't have been advised. I think it was to roll over. Can you see that? that yes, that's part of the screen, yeah. Thank you. And if we scroll over to the next, beginning of the next page, this just may assist you just by way of background. I won't read it, but you might want to just read that top paragraph to yourself. Yeah. And then can we turn to page four, please? We have your involvement there, pre-scan. Um, it's so good they've told us three times by the look of, looks of it. Are you able to assist us with what you may have been referring to there? Um, yes. Uh, in fact, that should be two times, not three times. Because um, the, the text that we've got at the beginning uh, has been pasted in twice for some reason. Thank you. Um, and, and then a, we have there defect cause updated to 40 general users. So again, in this case, we have the PM having problems rolling the office over, being given wrong advice by the help desk, and it is attributed to user error. Uh, does that assist you at all in the matters that we've previously been discussing about whether user error was used as some sort of default code for when cases came in? Not that I'm aware of. If we look on page seven, about halfway down the page, we have an entry from Martin McConnell at 12.55. Um, after my first run through, the stock balancing process has worked successfully as of the 27th of April 2000. Before passing this back with the event log, may I request the message store for node 1 is retrieved directly from it. I suspect there is a serious problem, repost-wise, question mark, question mark, uh, with this as opposed to the correspondence view of it. I shall still continue looking at subsequent weeks to see uh, why the situation never recovered itself. Do you remember issues with repost during... Uh, the early years of Horizon? Yes, there were a number of, number of problems with, with it. Um, but also, I'd just like to note that Martin has, just above at 9.32, changed the defect cause to general unknown. So it would be down to whoever was investigating, once they've got an idea of what the problem was, to clearly change that defect cause to whatever they thought it was. And I think in this call, um, that then gets changed again later on to either code or reference data, I think, somewhere. So yes. um, if we look two entries down, there's an entry from Martin McConnell said, this is another in instance of, and it gives the pinnacle or peak reference, uh, where the data server trees have failed to build. This has now been fixed in the software release. So this is clearly, ultimately, a software issue. Yes. Um, and, and you can see that defect calls have been updated to code. Yes. Now, as you highlighted, there is a defect code unknown. And that was the defect code that Mr. McConnell applied. Um, wouldn't it have made more sense to have applied defect code unknown uh, in your original entry on page four? Uh, yes. Thank you. I'm going to take you to one final document, and I'm just going to check, yes, it's on the system now. It's FUJ 0005724. Thank you very much. Um, you spent a bit of time with this document this morning. Yeah. Have you had sufficient time to have a look through to understand what's going on? Yes, I believe so. Thank you very much. Um, so this is described in the top there as transactions missing. And if we look at the bottom, we have detail of the customer call. And it says at the bottom, repeat call. When the PM did her daily reports yesterday, after having a new base unit fitted, there were transactions missing off them. 
if we scroll down, uh, when she entered the missing transactions, this corrected her daily reports, uh, but they were shown twice on her balance snapshot. Are you able to assist us briefly what, what that might mean? Uh, uh, well, she, she, well, she, ha she had a, she had a problem. There was a hardware problem, by the looks of it, with her counter one, also known as the gateway. Um, and, and so the engineer's been, he's replaced the hardware, uh, and when she's come to do her daily reports. Uh, she's realized that, so she's clearly done them on that new counter, and she realizes that, yeah, some of those transactions that she did earlier on, probably that day, um, weren't on her report. And yet she's got the receipts to sort of say, yes, I did do these transactions, so where are they? If we look at, at advice that's given halfway down, it says advise the caller to reverse her transactions, uh, that she's been... Uh, put in by doing a transaction log. The caller's happy to do this. Uh, advise the caller that if her reports are really bad, she would need to contact the NBSC, uh, but she would manage to balance. Did you recall why people might call the NBSC or the help desk uh, relating to um, issues balancing? So let's say they thought they had a technical issue. Should they call the NBSC or should they call the help desk if it related to balancing? Is that something that you were ever involved in? I uh, don't think so, but the MBSC, I think, were the post office own help desk. So obviously they would have an awareness of what a postmaster needs to do as part of their sort of daily business. And if it was a technical issue that resulted in an incorrect balance, who, who in your view, would be the appropriate uh, helpline to call? Uh, they would then call the HSH, who would then pass the call to SMC, who would then pass the call to SSC. Thank you. It says they contacted, spoke to the PM, uh, and she was query whether or not to reverse the transaction and what effect it would have on her stock. Uh, so it seems there, there as though the postmaster is a little concerned on uh, about what the implications of the advice would be. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Um, advised to contact the MBSC regarding the stock. If we scroll down over to the next page, I won't go through every entry. <coughs> Um, but we have there, near the bottom, contacted, called PM to clarify the information received, and PM is convinced there's a software problem. Uh, PM has been on the system for a long time, so is fully aware of the balancing procedure. Uh, so although this is um, in the year 2000, it's quite late in the year 2000, rollout ha had occurred, uh, and this postmaster was saying that they didn't have issues with their own balancing, it's a software issue. Yeah. Thank you. I think we can scroll through the next few pages. I mean, you, you've read all of these. Yeah. Um, perhaps we can go to page six. We're now on the 18th of November. Um, so the first call was the 15th of November. And we're now the 18th of November. Um, PM has called today to report the balance snapshots, which are printed off. Uh, two of the counters are showing different figures, even though they're attached to the same stock unit. Uh, she would like to speak to somebody from third line as soon as possible. And then we have Diane Rowe assigning this matter to yourself. Yeah. Are you able to assist us with why it would have been assigned to, to you? Um, probably because um, I was available. So even though it wasn't my particular area of expertise, uh, in the SSE, you were expected to handle any type of call. So you know, Diane would have looked at what calls have I got. Um, she may have come and spoke to me, you know, are you busy? Can I give you a call? And it's like, yeah, send it over. I'll have a look, see what I can do about it. We have below that Diane Rowe attributing the defect cause 99 general unknown. So, yeah, so in this instance, she didn't attribute it to a user. Correct, yeah. If we go over the page, um, 
your entry there, you say, I've had a look at the message store and I'm unable to match what the PM is saying in this call um, with what I see in the message store. Please provide date and time of the balance snapshot and trial balance reports that the PM is querying. Also require quantities and values for the gyro deposits, um, et cetera, et cetera. You, you're seeking further information there. Yeah. But about halfway down, you say, um, PM has not been contacted, closing as insufficient evidence. Um, can you assist us? Why would something be closed um, as insufficient evidence rather than kept open until that evidence has been obtained? Uh, because it was part of the responsibility of the SMC um, to provide whatever, all the evidence that they could provide for us to then go and investigate um, this, this problem. Um, so, yeah, I've you know, I've looked at what the PM has has reported, um, and normally you would be able to see those transactions in the message store. Um, and I've got this sort of very unusual situation where I've looked in the message store and I cannot find any evidence of those transactions ever occurring. Um, so I can't go any further with this. Um, and so that's why I ask for session ID, because maybe I'm looking in the wrong place on the message store. I mean, there were, was it 510,000 messages I think we'd got up to within this particular counter's message store uh, by this point. So you know that's an awful lot of messages to be looking through, um, whereas a session ID, I will be able to find, track that down relatively quickly and therefore be able to start my investigation in that area. Because it may be that there's a problem on the counter with the clock being wrong, and so Riposte is storing the wrong date and time in the message store, so I'm looking you know, on the wrong, what I think is, or what's shown to be the wrong, wrong date. Um, so there might be a, a date or time issue on the counter. Is that one potential? That, that's, yeah, that's, that's, well, that's one potential um, possibility for why I can't find those transactions. Because normally, you, know, you would be able to see those in the message store, and you go, OK, this is where I start my investigation. OK, so, so we have one potential might be a date and time issue on the counter. Another issue, might it potentially be an issue with the message store itself? Yes, and, and ultimately that's what it turns out to be. There is, an, there is a post error here um, where um, counter one, um, when, you, when, you when, you replace, when you replace a counter, um, it comes with a blank message store. So repost will start up and it will then call out to the other counters in the post office to say, okay, have, have you got any messages for me? So those counters would then reply saying, yeah, I've got 510,000 messages for you. And you know, here you go. So, so that counter would then start reading those messages in uh, and writing them to its own message store. Once it's got all those messages, it, it can then start writing its own messages to that message store. And one of the first messages would be a repost version string message uh, and that and so that's how we would know by looking by seeing that message we would know that repost has been restarted at that point um, there was a bug whereby um, the counter would think that okay I've got all my messages now but in fact it didn't so there were still some messages to be sent across and for some re for whatever reason um, uh, repost we we, we sort of call that about repost coming back online too soon. Um, so, and that's, that's what seems to have happened here. So, so that's what happens ultimately. Um, if we're looking at 1629.44, um, uh, where you've said PM has not been contacted, closing is insufficient evidence, going through your mind at that stage, um, you mentioned might be a date and time issue on the counter itself. You've now mentioned a repost problem that it could potentially be. Were those thoughts that would have been in your mind at the time? Yes. Yes. Um, if we look two entries down, 
162945, again, you have responded to call type L uh, as category 96, this time insufficient evidence. Um, but then two entries below that, defect cause updated to 40, general user. Um, so again, we have something that clearly in your mind might be a software error, it might be a counter error, um, but it's there being attributed to user error. Um, does that assist you in, in answering the question that I asked some time ago about whether there was um, a, a, an approach to attributing things to users um, a, as a default? I have no idea why I selected that. Uh, I mean, that, I don't think, so the category 96, insufficient evidence, that's what would go back to power help um, to alert the SMC that, okay, I'm asking for more evidence. Um, can you get the evidence and then send it back to me? Um, why I would have picked general user, I, ha I yeah, sorry, I don't know. One thing that we heard during the human evidence sessions in this inquiry was um, postmasters uh, being told that uh, they were at fault, um, that the issue was user error, not software error. Um, looking at back at these documents, do, do you think there was a culture of attributing things to user error? No, but I can certainly see how you could come to that conclusion. I mean, there are three or so pinnacles that have been attributed to user error. Yeah. Rather than insufficient evidence or unknown error or anything along that. I mean, there are multiple options available. Yes, I mean, I have errors. no idea what, what, I, what else I could have put, but to my mind, you know, looking at this, um, that's, that's wrong. So I don't know why I would have picked user. If we scroll down, staying on this page, um, you have entries there. You say, I've spoken to PM last night and advised that this is being looked into. And then over the page, you have quite a long explanation about what you think the issue is. Are you able to summarize for us very briefly, one, one to point to one to seven, what you thought at that stage the issue may have been? Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so on the um, 20th, I've obviously, I've, I've sent it back. So on the 21st, I probably did nothing with the call, expecting it to sort of come back to me with the evidence I'd asked for. Um, but as it says uh, at the beginning of that sort of long list, um, there was a problem with the OTI, the interface between PowerHelp and Pinnacle. Um, so I don't think that what I'd asked, that the stuff that I typed in there didn't go back into PowerHelp, so the SMC had no idea. So I suspect that on the 22nd, I would probably have spoken to the SMC to say, you know, what, are you, what are you guys doing about this particular call? You know, can you give me the evidence and send it back to me? Uh, at which point, uh, you know, they say, what, what evidence have you asked? You know, we haven't got that. That hasn't come across. Um, but clearly, because uh, I started work, I started, was it 8.50 in the morning, I think, I think it was? Sorry, yes, 8.52, I cloned the call. So I imagine on the 22nd, I've actually looked at this myself, not ha without the call coming back to me, um, I've looked at what's been going on, uh, and I would probably have spoken to either Pat Cowell or John Simpkins and said, you know, I've got this unusual call, I can't see these messages that, or transactions that the PM says they've done, um, any ideas? And I suspect they've probably gone, well, you could have a look, see what, what do the counters themselves say, because as a default, we would have gone to the correspondence server and the messages on the correspondence server. That's where we'd normally look uh, when we had a, a, to investigate a message store. So I've then gone down onto the actual counters themselves and noticed that, yes, um, as I said at the top there, uh, counter two has 48 messages which are not on counter one. Um, so clearly something rather serious has gone wrong with repost. Um, and then it's... Uh, conversation with development to say, okay, how do I fix this? And if we look at the conversation with development, you say, can development please investigate on whether there's a deficiency in repost and what can be done to stop this happening again? 
also need advice on how to get the message store in sync and to include the missing transactions. Did you have a concern at this stage um, that the missing transactions wouldn't be retrieved? Um, no, because the missing transactions are, were, on, were, were on counters two and three. The problem was they weren't on counter one and they weren't on the correspondence server and that would cause problems uh, when we're retrieving uh, cash account messages via the agents which would have looked at the correspondence server messages and so they would miss the transactions that were on counters two and three. So, so they wouldn't, so um, there were APS, yeah, some of the transactions are APS. So yeah, there's, a, uh, I can't remember what APS, automa automated payments or something, I can't remember. Um, so they, so you know, you've got customer, customers saying, paying a gas bill, for example, um, you know, they've paid, they've got the receipts, but their account wouldn't be updated because those messages on counters two and three w aren't at the correspondence server. So it's, so I'm asking, okay, how do we get these transactions back onto the correspondence server so that they can be harvested so the customer, you know, bills get paid? And, but you also have a concern below the highlighted section you say also, how will this affect their balancing? They are currently in cash account uh, period, cash accounting period 34. So you're raising a question there about what effect this will actually have on the sub postmaster's ability to balance. Yes. If we scroll down to the next page, please, you've got the, peer, the postmaster chasing the progress of this call. And um, that's 10.59, so they're chasing again. She's concerned about balancing tomorrow. Um, I've said the call is currently with development. Do we have an update? So you seem to be anxious there to receive an update for the postmaster. Is that a fair summary of that entry? Yes. I mean, I, yeah, I know it's important that the post office balances. Um, so yeah, you know, I want to make sure she can she can balance and roll over into the next cash cash account period. We have an entry at 14.17.19 from Martin McConnell. A note to be passed on to the customer for balancing. Uh, this problem has occurred with replication before, in essence due to a failure with repost for whatever um, to replicate back down. So again, we've spoken about issues with, with repost. Um, the suggestion is that this is an issue here with re repost. Um, it should be perfectly okay to continue balancing on nodes two or three, but not on node one where the failure occurred. He says, from the repost point of view, there seems to be a major disagreement on what the content, and it gives um, some code there that I won't try and understand, um, for about 50 messages should be. Uh, there are minor glitches here and there, but this seems to be a major discrepancy. Is this something you remember at all, this particular issue? Um, not particularly, um, but I mean, if, I mean, it's fairly clear what's going on from the content of the call itself, so. If we scroll down to the next page, Martin McConnell there says, uh, this blows my whole understanding of what repost should be handling on our behalf, i.e. replication, not deviation across nodes. I mean, does it seem as though this is quite a significant issue? Oh, yes, indeed, yeah. Um, you have it continues and you have a, a paragraph at the, at the bottom of the next paragraph. It says, whatever happens, this bug should end up with Escher development, I think that is. So that's, I think, the team that Gareth Jenkins and others were part of, is that? I believe so, that's, yes. Um, and then you appear again and you say, I've spoken to the PM and advised her to roll over to counters two or three, not one, uh, but have not mentioned about recovering the AP tr transaction. So, can you assist us with what you mean there? Um, well, I've was, I was spoken to the PM and given, passed on the advice from development to yeah, don't use counter one to do it because um, the, the AP transactions that she needs in order to balance are on two and three. Counter one knows nothing about them. Um, 
Now, I think probably why I didn't mention about recovering the AP transactions is probably as part of the conversation that I had with the PM, because she, I then go on to say, since the PM recovered the transactions and then reversed them, uh, and then I've got a further question of, okay, sort of what, what kind of effect is that going to have? So you say, can development please advise on whether the PM does need to recover the AP transaction since the PM recovered the transactions and then reversed them? If she balances on counter two, will it take the AP transactions from its copy or will it look, only look at AP transactions done on counter two? Uh, so you seem to be raising there really an issue with the integrity of, uh, of the balance and the transactions and, and the ability for the sub-postmaster to effectively balance. Is that a fair summary? Um, yes. I mean, I, I suspect from reading that that um, the, the bit of code that does the, that of retrieving the um, messages to do with balancing um, would look on its own counter um, rather than simply go to um, yeah, no, no, look on its own counter, which is why the advice was don't do it on node one because we've got a bunch of missing transactions. Um, so if you did it on node one, then you're not going to balance. But those missing transactions are on counter two and three. So if you do it on one of those, then yeah, you should balance. But is there still a lack of clarity as to what's going to happen with the transactions from node one? Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, which, yes, because I think that's what I'm sort of asking is how is this going to affect sort of when, when the harvesters sort of try and harvest for these AP transactions, um, is that going to... So whilst, whilst the counter, whilst the post office itself would be able to balance, um, that might have a knock-on effect on when we harvest those transactions up from the correspondence server, and obviously we then send information off to post office for them to actually pay the customers. So I think that's what I'm asking. So there may ultimately still be missing transactions somewhere in the system. Yes, yeah. If we go over the page, please. We have... Um, a message from Brian Orzel to Gareth Jenkins. Gareth, should we deal with this? Do we have value to add, uh, or has it been misrooted? And Gareth Jenkins says, I don't know that I can add anything useful here. This is another example of recovery having gone wrong after the box swap. Um, and I'll just read the final paragraph of that page. It says, this resulted in about 50 messages being lost the gateway did not communicate with the slave until it had written at least 50 messages. Um, for this reason, there was no error indicating a self-originating message being found. Um, I'll read the second paragraph there. It says, um, other than pursuing the known problem of how we handle fouled up recovery covered by a separate pinnacle, I don't think I can add anything further to this pinnacle and so it might as well be closed. I assume that the missing transactions have been recovered manually. Now, knowing what you know about this issue and having reread this pinnacle, um, do you think assuming that the missing transactions have been recovered manually uh, was the appropriate assumption to make at that time? For Gareth, yes. Uh, why do you qualify he, that? Well, he, has, he hasn't got um, access to the message stores on the correspondence server, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be down to development to reconcile those missing transactions with the post office. That would be an MSU uh, action. Uh, and uh, I, th I think somewhere I... I cloned the call, this call, I think. Um, yes, so on... Uh, oh, no, that's not that one. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so immediately after Brian Orzel, 
on the 1st of December, 1118, I clone this call um, to PC59052, which I'm assuming I would have sent, that would be the call that I would have sent off to MSU with the details for those APS transactions and any other transactions for them to s sort out the reconciliation with the post office. So was that an assumption that the MSU would take it on and that it didn't be an issue for the development team? Yes. Um, so where Gareth Jenkins is there saying, I assume the missing transactions have been recovered manually, are you saying that was appropriate because it's effectively not his job to look into whether in fact the missing transactions had or had not been uh, recovered manually? Yes. Uh, and knowing what we now know about everything that happened with Horizon, do you think that that approach, not having sight of beginning to end uh, and what ultimately happened to the transactions, is in any way problematic? I don't think so, because it was MSU's responsibility. They had the link with post office, so they were the ones who had the job of doing the, the actual reconciliation. Um, Gareth can't do anything more from a development point of view because they already know about the problem and presumably are pursuing it under Pinnacle 528823. So would it have been typical for um, Gareth Jenkins and his team and, in fact, the wider SSC um, to not be concerned with what ultimately happened to the missing transactions because that was a matter for another team? Um, no, we would have been concerned and I think Gareth is voicing his concern here by saying, you know, I assume that the missing transactions have been recovered manually. So he's, he's asking, has, he's basically asking, has that been done? Um, and the, the answer is, is yes. But all we all... Where, where's the answer, sorry? Well, well, the fact that I've cloned the call to PC59052. So does that mean you know that the missing transactions have been recovered manually? Yes. I don't, I don't know if... Is that... That's probably not a later... No, I mean, there's nothing... I mean, there's nothing in this pinnacle to say that that has happened. So you would need to have a look at PC59052... So but I suspect that's, that's the call that I would have sent to the MSU to say, look, this has happened, give an explanation, and these are details of the transactions, and it's down to them to sort of whatever the process was for reconciling that with post office. So would you have taken responsibility for ensuring that that question that he asks was in fact answered yes. uh, and that the feedback that came back was, yes, the missing transactions have been recovered manually? Um, I probably wouldn't have gotten back to Gareth to say, yes, they have been, but um, that kind of response, I would have thought, would be on that call that I cloned, that I would have sent to MSU. Uh, and would you have taken it forward if uh, the transactions, if there wasn't any feedback from them that the transactions had been recovered? Would you have been responsible for this call going forward up until its conclusion? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I mean, yes, when I clone the call, I would then send it to the MSU team. Once they've done the reconciliation, they would close, or they would, I don't know, would they, I don't know if they closed the call back to me, or they would reassign it back to the SSC to say, thank you, yeah, we've done a reconciliation, this call can now be closed. And is that what we see at, uh, on the 12th of December 2000, where you have called, closed the call? Um, no, that's for this particular call. You'd have to look at 59052 to see what happened there. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. I don't think anybody else does either. Um, sir, do you have any questions? No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for attending uh, and answering the questions and providing a witness statement. Thank you very much. 
Sir, it's now 12 o'clock. Yeah. May I propose that we take a 10 or 15 minute break and then we move on to closing statements? Mr. Beer has um, something to say um, about other evidence that's going to be published, but that will be brief and then we can move on to the closing statements. And are those making the closing statements, I mean, I'm saying this to, to make it as easy for them as possible, wanting their, to, to, sorry, to, to carry on making the closing statements once we've had our 15 minute break, or are we planning to have a, a lunchtime break as usual? Sir, may I assist if I, if I just mention my, my intention, if it, uh, um, yeah, if it fits your requirements. Um, sir, I intend to be somewhere between 45 minutes and 50 minutes, which may take us a little while into the lunch break, but I hope to be no later than 1.15. Yeah. Now, that's working on an assumption, uh, uh, a reasonable one, that I've had by ha after having a discussion with Mr. Beer about how long he is going to take with his remarks on other statements. So right. um, hopefully uh, that will then take us to about 1.15, then we have a lunch break, and then others will resume after that, if that suits the uh, inquiry. Certainly suits me. Suits, does it suit those in the room? Sir, I'd be next up, and I'd be content to take whatever course suited everybody else, either to follow on from Mr Steen without there being a, a long lunch break as usual, because I'll only be 25 minutes, or to take that lunch break. And who's following Mr Maloney? Uh, I am, sir, and I'm very grateful to Mr Maloney, because I, I thought that he was going next, and in fact, we, we, we misinterpreted each other, but he's very kindly agreed to follow Mr. Steen. I yeah. have got about seven pages of written notes, so I do hope to be 15 minutes. Well, I think my current view is that um, after we've heard from Mr. Steen, um, and if it is around about 1.15, we'll then take stock again as to whether people actually want a full hour or whether they want, say, half an hour or something less than that. We'll just, we'll just go along and see how people feel, all right? So we'll take our quarter of an hour now and then come back. And will it be Mr. Beer and then the closing submission? Yes. Yeah. Thank you fine. very much, sir. All right, fine. Sir, good afternoon. Can you uh, see and hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, as you know, the inquiry is asked to build upon the findings of Mr Justice Fraser in the Bates judgment and the judgments of the Court of Appeal in Hamilton and the Post Office and of other criminal courts to establish a clear account of the failings of Horizon over its life cycle and the post office's use of information from it when taking action against persons alleged to be responsible for shortfalls. In phase three, you have heard evidence um, of these issues at an operational level. The evidence has covered uh, the issues of training, the advice and assistance available to postmasters, the dispute resolution procedure, and the rectification of bugs, errors, and defects. You will have paid careful attention to the three qu questions that run through every stage of the inquiry, who knew what and when, about the issues within Horizon. Uh, since January of this year, you've heard evidence from over 30 witnesses. You're still to hear evidence from Gareth Jenkins on phase three issues and from Anne Chambers on a small number of phase three issues. The evidence that you've heard since January is, of course, but a small sample of those working at the operational level within the post office and Fujitsu over the many years that Horizon has been live. Um, it is, we say, unnecessary to hear further oral evidence given the extensive documentation that the inquiry has received and the detailed findings of Mr Justice Fraser in relation to bugs, errors and defects. Moreover, to hear a greater sample of oral evidence would inevitably mean commencing phases four and five of the inquiry at a much later stage. 
those phases concern the way in which the post office conducted prosecutions and uh, responded to the emerging scandal. It's important to move to investigate those issues as soon as reasonably practicable. Uh, your inquiry team conducted further investigations to obtain written witness statements from people involved in various roles relating to the operation of Horizon. Uh, the purpose of that exercise was twofold. Firstly, to obtain a wider range of evidence on how the various teams worked in practice for those, from those uh, at the coalface. And secondly, to test what evidence they were aware of, of existing, the existence of bugs, errors, and defects in Horizon. This was done by sending short Rule 9 requests asking general questions tailored to the respective roles. The inquiry sought statements from those involved in the post office support services, including Horizon field support officers, NBSC members, trainers and contract managers. The inquiry also sought similar um, evidence from those working in the uh, Fujitsu, Fujitsu operated help desk and the SSC. The inquiry has finalized statements from a selection of these witnesses. And I'm going to say a few words now on the investigation into each of them and display the URNs for the various statements in each of those categories that the inquiry has uh, obtained. Uh, those statements will be admitted into evidence and treated as having been read into the record. And the witness statements will shortly be disclosed on the inquiry's website. So firstly, post office support services. Uh, I begin with the teams in the post office assigned to provide advice and assistance. And in response to the various Rule 9 requests, the post office has provided the inquiry with various lists of current and former staff who worked in different operational and management teams throughout the company. Uh, we use this information to send Rule 9 requests directly to such people. The inquiry took a representative sample of people who had worked as Horizon Field Support Officers or on the NBSC. And you'll recall hearing evidence about Horizon Field Support Officers or HFSOs during both phases two and three. They were post office employees who dealt with branches as they migrated to Horizon from the paper-based systems. A number of HFSOs transferred to work on the NBSC, providing ongoing support to the branch network. Uh, overall, the inquiry sent over 70 Rule 9 requests to people who had worked as HFSOs or on the NBSC. Those Rule 9 requests sought evidence on the training given to those employees and to sub-postmasters their experiences in these roles and the adequacy of the support provided and their knowledge of bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon system. I wonder whether we could um, uh, display INQ 40s 2006. And move to page two, please. The inquiry received final witness statements from 45 people within this cohort. And on this page, uh, the next page, and the following page, those 45 names are displayed and the URNs of each of the 45 witness statements are also displayed. Uh, they are to be treated, please, as read into the record. The inquiry also carried out a similar exercise with contract managers, please. Can we look at page five? Thank you. The Rule 9 request to these witnesses was broader, covering all aspects of phase three, including dispute resolution. We received 13 witness statements following that exercise, and the names of those witnesses and their URNs are displayed on the screen. May they be treated as read into the record, please. And finally, so far as the post office is concerned, the inquiry identified a number of people involved in training through reviewing the documentary evidence and the comments of other witnesses. We sent Rule 9 requests to those identified 
to seek evidence on the nature of the training provided to postmasters, as well as uh, the extent to which bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon system were dealt with in the training programme. If we can turn to page six, please. The inquiry received 11 finalised witness statements um, from such uh, uh, trainers, and the names and URNs of those witnesses are now shown. May they be treated as read into the record, please. Can I turn to um, Fujitsu support services? Uh, following a Rule 9 request, Fujitsu provided to the inquiry a list of all of those people it had on record who had worked on its uh, help desk. The Rule 9 request sent to each such witness sought evidence on the training provided to help desk operatives, the day-to-day -day work on the help desk, the adequacy of the support provided, and whether there was knowledge of errors, bugs and defects within the Horizon system. The inquiry received um, 13 finalised witness statements from uh, a selected sample. The names of those uh, witnesses and the URNs for their statements are shown on the screen. Um, I should also read in the statement of Julie Welsh, who deals with issues on the help desk, <coughs> but needn't be called in this phase. Uh, she's an addition and her URN is WITN 0450. 100. Uh, I should also, if we move to page 8, please, uh, propose to read in five witness statements that have been finalised from people working in the SSC. These members of the SSC were sent short Rule 9 requests to obtain their witness evidence covering how the SSC worked and their own knowledge of bugs, errors and defects. Their names are displayed along with the URNs. May they be treated as read into the record. Uh, that PowerPoint presentation can come down. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the uh, statements that the inquiry wishes to read into the record at this stage. Uh, your team continues to receive some signed statements that will be read in at an appropriate juncture later in the inquiry. I should pause at this stage to note that the inquiry has received a significant volume of disclosure during the course of the phase three hearings, and it expects to receive more disclosure that is or may be relevant to phase three in the very near future. Moreover, it expects some of this disclosure to contain guidance given to the MBSC and the Fujitsu run help desk. The inquiry will, of course, keep these uh, documents under review and will disclose them to core participants as soon as reasonably practicable after their receipt. Uh, moreover, it will not hesitate to recall any witnesses where it considers it is necessary to do so, to put questions to them on new documents that have come to light. The appropriate time uh, to do that will be determined in due course, but will likely be during the phase five hearings. So that's all I say at the moment in terms of reading documents um, into the record. And I think we now move to the closing submissions from three core participants uh, in an order that has been agreed amongst them. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beer. And for the avoidance of any doubt, I confirm that the statements identified by Mr. Beer during the course of his oral address are now to be treated as having been read into the record. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Steen, whenever you're ready. Thank you, sir. So this morning you referred to Veronica May. She passed away seven days ago. She was the loved wife of Francis May. And you may recall that Francis and his wife, Veronica, ran the Bidford-upon-Avon post office in Warwickshire. Veronica's health was affected by the financial state that was left for her and her husband to deal with after they had been made bankrupt by the actions of the post office. She developed angina. You'll probably recall Mr. May's experiences being read into the record at the hearing in Glasgow on the 11th of May 2022. 
Francis May is now 73 years old. He has been a very active corporate participant in the inquiry. He's followed the inquiry closely, attended our group meetings with our clients, and he regularly provides instructions and views. He was, of course, a um, GLO claimant, and by extracting solicitors Howe & Co are assisting him in relation to his stage two GLOW ex gratia claim. Francis and Veronica were together for 24 years. He says, we were the best of pals. My right arm, he says, is literally ripped off. Francis was brought up in a part of Ireland where he learnt to read and write first in Irish and Gaelic. And then he was taught Latin and Greek. As such, his written use of English is poor, spelling not very good, and his wife, Veronica, used to do all of the reading and writing for him in relation to the inquiry. He does not know now what he will do in order to read information from How and Co and how to write emails and how to put forward instructions. He is, of course, going to be supported in everything he does by my instructing solicitors, How and Co. Francis says that when they lost their home as a result of the post office's actions, Veronica worked multiple jobs to maintain them. He found it extremely difficult to get any work anywhere because the post office wouldn't give him a reference. He has even asked for a reference when he went for a, a job picking fruit on a farm and he couldn't get the job because he couldn't get the reference. Francis did get an interim payment under the GLOW scheme just before Christmas. But sir, as you observed, the trustees in bankruptcy took a lot of that award. And you'll recall that that matter was addressed by my junior, Mr. Chris Jacobs, on the 27th. When he and Veronica first met, he told her he would take her on a cruise one day but they obviously couldn't afford it after they lost everything as a result of the post office. When Veronica was in hospital, she saw a saga magazine which showed a cruise around Scotland, and she reminded him of his promise to take her on the cruise. Sadly, she of course died, and they never got to go on the cruise. In terms of what Francis May hopes from this inquiry, he, he comments, he's not in good health, but he would like to be able to live as comfortably as possible in his final years. He says, I'd like the senior people at the post office and Fujitsu to be held to account and taken to court. They knew the system was wrong. He lost his post office in about 2010, when Glenn Chester walked in one morning out of the blue before they opened and checked the balances. And he balanced, but he was still suspended on the spot. Mr. May would very much like to meet Mr. Chester again and discuss exactly the actions that were taken by Mr. Chester in the post office with him. In terms of his view of phase three, Francis May says this, he knows that he and other glow litigants and other core participants are in good hands with this inquiry. But he feels that the post office is trying to kick the, kick the can down the road until we are all dead. The deadline for GLOW compensation of August 2024 is plain wrong, he says. And they, he believes, they, the post office, should not have the right to set that date. And everything is always dictated by the post office. And that's the way he feels. Finally says, if ever some of the leaders at the post office are taken to court, I will be at that court, he says. And he hopes that doesn't sound vicious. But he hopes and prays that the little man will win out in the end. So as you know, with Mr. Jacobs, I represent a, a large number of sub-postmasters 
and mistresses before this inquiry. And we have been instructed by Ho and Co solicitors. Of course, our written submissions after this date will provide more details on the matters that I cover today. The closing submissions for phase two from the post office dated the 7th of December of 2022 made little reference to its own failures and preferred to suggest that the passage of time has dimmed recollections. You'll see those references at paragraphs three and four. And then the post office turns its tank turret gun on Fujitsu, paragraph five to paragraph 29.6. In particular, in paragraph five, the post office flat out accuses Fujitsu of making a concerted effort, going on to say, in many of the Fujitsu witness statements, to suggest that Pohl had the same level of understanding of the technical problems and challenges as Fujitsu did. And at paragraph 29.5, the post office accuses Fujitsu of deception. I quote, Fujitsu did not inform Pohl of these serious issues. This must have been a deliberate decision. The serious issues being referred to at paragraph 29.4 was that Fujitsu was aware at all levels of management that the Horizon project was facing serious problems. Now the post office poll is a wholly owned business with one shareholder, the government, managed through UKGI. And it is therefore saying that its current business partner Fujitsu an international company of some size and renown has, de has deliberately misled its customer. Both through the years of the, of the Horizon uh, Systems operation and to date in preparing statements for this inquiry. And it has done so with its witnesses in order to try and shift the blame onto the post office. Well, on behalf of the sub-postmasters, mistresses I represent, I'm afraid I cannot wish Fujitsu well. But I can warn Fujitsu that once the post office takes a stance, no matter how ill-conceived it is, it doesn't give up. Remember, my clients were accused of malfeasance and criminality over decades. But these accusations of this type of conduct by the post office does not match up with the reality of today's business affairs between the post office and Fujitsu. So far, the Horizon contract has been extended from 2023 to 2024 at the cost of many millions. Well, the meetings to discuss the matters of these contractual extensions must be merry affairs, sir, with Fujitsu staff, one assumes, rather, rather reluctant to talk to the post office representatives just in case they get accused of making things up. The post office has considerable form for blaming others. The post office blamed and criminalized sub-postmasters throughout the history of Horizon, blamed the litigants in the High Court and said they were making it up, and now seeks to blame Fujitsu, when the truth, sir, is that Fujitsu and Pol are equally to blame in the partnership of deception in which the post office was the senior partner. Of course, the problem for the post office is that they now have issues with the creation of a cloud-based replacement for the Horizon system, meaning that Pohl has to keep extending the Horizon contract. The post office procurement documents of 6th of April 2023 make interesting reading. I quote, the program to transfer the services to a new cloud provider created fundamental technical challenges that poll could not economically and technically overcome. And the business has taken the decision to pivot back to the, to the Fujitsu provided Horizon data services until the successful tender of services out of Horizon, referring then to a cost of 16,500,000 million pounds. Well, something about that procurement process sounds rather familiar to us who have been listening to the evidence before this inquiry. But so that's not the only post office news. Unfortunately, recent press reports show that the post office, postal affairs minister was called to the House of Commons to answer how a grotesque, the word used in the press, 
executive bonus scheme was approved on the basis that the post office has helped this inquiry with, apparently, I quote, all required evidence and information supplied on time, with confirmation from Sir Wynne Williams and team that post office's performance supported and enabled the inquiry to finish in line with expectations. Well, that, that reference that it wished to refer to doesn't appear to have been correct. This was referred to by members of parliament as a deliberate lie and caused you, sir, on the 5th of May to ask for some clarification, quoting from your correspondence. Given it suggested that a metric had been set and a target had been achieved with confirmation given from myself and my team. Well, sir, sometimes it's tempting to suggest that the post office couldn't run an average celebration in a brewery, but unfortunately it's more sinister than that. The post office remains a thoroughly dishonest and duplicitous organization. The post office opening statement, the written statement dated 4th of October, 2022, begins with Post Office Limited poll apologizes for the suffering and damage caused to every person who has been affected by the Horizon IT scandal. That includes not only postmasters directly affected by poll's failures, but all others, including in particular their families, whose lives have been impacted by those failures. And poll goes on to say that they remain fully supportive of this inquiry and its aim to get to the bottom of what went wrong saying and finishing, Paul will do all it can to help the inquiry achieve that. From our client's point of view, the statements and actions of the post office demonstrate that they are not contrite. Lessons have not been learned, and I suggest that no one would bet against the next target for the post office blame game being this inquiry. Our clients were not liars not conarsis and not incompetent. The post office's horizon system was foisted upon sub-postmasters and mistresses. Post office and Fujitsu knew it was not fit for purpose and never was. They lied about its robustness and, and blamed over decades sub-postmasters for their own failures. And we suggest the post office knowingly ruined lived, lives, solid reputations, broke many sub-postmasters and tried to break the rest. Having heard the evidence in phase three, our clients' views could be summarized in this way. We told you so. They never learn and they don't listen. The evidence, sir, in phase three has confirmed what our clients have long known the post office didn't provide any adequate training on balancing and failed to ensure that the Horizon help desk provided any sort of meaningful assistance when things started to go wrong. It was always inevitable that things were going to go badly wrong. We know this, for example, from the evidence of Mr. Parker and others. The system was patched together to keep it limping along because nobody wanted to spend money to rewrite the EPOS program. If the paucity of training and assistance issues were not bad enough, there was a sting in the tail for sub-postmasters, the IMPACT program, which effectively programmed out the sub-postmasters' remaining chance to dispute phantom horizon shortfalls. On behalf of our client group, we highlighted this issue to the inquiry upon reading the statement of Susan Harding. And we asked the inquiry to look closely at her evidence and the evidence relating to IMPACT because this program encapsulated everything that was wrong about Paul's treatment of sub-postmasters. So as you all recall, the impact program abolished the local suspense accounts and in doing so forced sub-postmasters to accept all demands made of them on pain of no longer being able to trade. This created an impossible situation for sub-postmasters the equivalence of heads you pay and tails you pay. Our clients commented on the evidence relating to the impact program. Kevin Palmer said this, we never stood a chance. They dealt the cards, checked the deck, took all the aces and left us the jokers. Sally Stringer says, 
It was their way of making sure that the branch office paid, regardless of the circumstances. Ms Harding gave evidence before you on the 22nd of February and confirmed that post office thought that sub-postmasters were using suspense accounts to hide discrepancies instead of resolving them. Ms Harding acknowledged on the 22nd of February that one of the aims of the project, the impact project, was to pursue losses and push sub-postmasters harder in order to pursue debt recovery. She gave us an insight into what Paul thought of sub-postmasters. At page 30 of the transcript, that date, the 22nd of February, in answering the questions from Mr. Beer. Mr. Beer asked, did you have a mindset in the entirety of your time working for the post office that the suspense accounts was being used by dishonest sub-postmasters to hide and cover up money that they were taking? Answer. My mindset was that it was a place where they could do that. Question. And did do that? Ms. Harding said, yes, and did do that. Ms. Harding also confirmed that the original idea, as put to her by Mr. Beer, was get rid of these postmasters hiding discrepancies in the suspense accounts and make sure they're liable for all shortfalls. It is abundantly clear that the post office's institutional view of sub-postmasters was that they were dodgy and on the take. In her statement, which, sir, as you will recall, we established in her evidence that she wrote herself from her own recollection. She set out the impact program design parameters. Paragraph 18, she referred to the principal objectives of impact were to reduce losses and improve debt recovery. In her statement and her evidence, she made it clear that the concept and high-level designs were developed through a series of workshops involving Fujitsu and the post office experts and user representatives. It was agreed during, uh, paragraph 31 of her statement, it was agreed during the design of impact that the suspense accounts would be removed as historically it was used by sub-postmasters to hide discrepancies in their accounts rather than resolve them. The impact program started in 2003. It went on through various iterations and discussions into about 2006. It was put into effect. It is an important part of the evidence as it brings together the, the different parts of the thinking that was being used by the post office in its approach to sub-postmasters. Our client questions says, how could the post office dare to suggest this, that the allegation against sub-postmasters generally that they were dealing with matters in this way and hiding matters in the, in the suspense account is disgusting. Helen Walker-Brown, she says, she is deeply aggrieved that she was deprived of an option to reject what the system said. She says that the decision to remove the local suspense account was unfair and downright immoral. <clears throat> I said earlier that the post office was the senior partner. We can see that. Fujitsu's client, the post office, set the goals as we saw from the Fujitsu version of the impact documents. I won't ask it to go on the screen, I'll just refer to the reference number for the moment. That's FUJ 00098169. That's the Fujitsu Services input to feasibility study for end-to-end -end re -architecting of post office systems, dated 24th of March, 2003. That document refers to the goals and business drivers behind the E2E project. Paragraph 3.2, sorry, 3.2.4. The following key business priorities were identified. Simplify identification of debt. Reduce the amount of reconciliation. Increase the amount of debt recovered. And 
put the emphasis on clients and customers to validate the data. At 3.2.4, in recognition of these priorities, this project addresses specific requirements beyond these business drivers and issues, which were refocus on debt recovery, brackets, financial recovery of money, close brackets, target 95%. Our clients would like to know who's ultimately responsible for the impact program. Ms. Harding, you may recall, referred to uh, being instructed by Ms. Cruttenden and Peter Corbett. We'll address those issues a little bit more in our written submissions. Ms. Harding's evidence shows that the post office had a twin mindset in respect of sub-postmasters, which pre-existed the impact program and was dictated to Fujitsu as its client instruction. And those were these. That SPMs, sub-postmasters, were liable for shortfalls and that SPMs were fundamentally dishonest. The same twin mindset also drove the post office's conduct in this scandal from the first demands of payment arising from horizon shortfalls shortly after rollout until matters were exposed in the findings made by Mr. Justice Fraser in 2019. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Sorry. You'll recall recently the evidence of Mr. Ismay on the 11th of May. He remained of the view that sub-postmasters were contractually liable for all shortfalls. In other words, this is not a historic view. Mr. Ismay left the employee of the post office in 2016. What we have seen is an event storm, and I adopt the term used by Ms. Chambers, of bullying, institutional entitlement, and downright dishonesty. It is notable that sub postmasters were looked down upon by the post office and treated in a completely different way to Crown Office employees, apparently justified by the difference between sub-postmaster's agent status versus Crown branch employees. The evidence we suggest in phase three demonstrates that the post office and Fujitsu both knew that the horizon system contained bugs, errors, and defects. It is this aspect of the post office's behavior, the fact that post office employees knew all along that horizon was fundamentally flawed and unreliable that makes the scandal so truly shocking. Trevor Rollinson told the inquiry on the 20th of January 2023 that it was common knowledge at the post office that SPMs were having problems with balancing. The evidence of Gary Blackburn, a former national office, uh, a former post office national network business support center team leader and problem manager. Mr. Blackburn confirmed that the post office was aware of the bugs errors and defects within the Horizon system, and that there was an active exchange of information between senior staff and Gareth Jenkins at Fujitsu. Mr. Blackburn was no stranger to defects within the Horizon system. He confirmed in his oral evidence on the 28th of February that he was aware of the ability of Horizon to create discrepancies. Mr. Blackburn was also aware of the calendar square bug and the risk of branches being impacted. He was another post office employee who had sight of the email dated 23rd of February 2006 from Anne Chambers, Mrs. Chambers, concerning a repost problem. In that email, Mrs. Chambers said that the problem had been around for years and affected a number of sites most weeks. Mr. Blackburn later became aware of four or five post offices having the same problem and escalated the matter to problem, to problem management. It is, so we suggest, absolutely beyond doubt that the post office knew what was going on. Any submission or representation made by the post office that they were kept in the dark by Fujitsu should be firmly rejected. You may have noted that there was a tendency from post office witnesses within phase three to say that they were unaware of the problems with Horizon at the time, but with the benefit of hindsight, except that the system was not robust. For example, Chris Gilding, a former team, uh, field team leader at Pole, 
typifies this mindset in his evidence on the 13th of January, when he rejected statements to the effect that the computer was the problem and not the sub-postmaster. Mr. Gilding took, told the inquiry that he took the view that he had no evidence to suggest otherwise and made no inquiries as to the reliability of the data that the system was producing. Bruce McNiven, Deputy Director of the Post Office's Programme Delivery Authority, told the inquiry on the 10th of January that he understood from the fact that Horizon had reached acceptance that he could apply a presumption of rectitude to the system. Anne Alaka, formerly of Post Office Services, told the inquiry on the 1st of March 23 that there was a general view held by the Post Office contract advisors that Horizon could not create discrepancies. Clearly, the general view was wrong. The Post Office expected sub-postmasters and mistresses to prove that the computer was at fault. And this was embedded into the impact program. Of course, no one bothered to consider whether postmasters could possibly do this, where they'd be locked out of their branches, their documents taken away from them, and the Horizon system was designed to prevent them challenging the numbers it spewed out. So a big question arises. Why senior managers within the post office failed to disabuse other key employees and contract advisors of this fiction? It is relevant to note that Ms. Alica later accepted in her evidence that, is, that a dismissive approach from the top filtered down. One of our clients, Ms. Walker-Brown, says something similar. She says that staff further down in poll may have believed the lies that the hierarchy told her or told them. And she refers to the example of her own area manager simply ignoring her when she was begging for help. So why would what used to be called the nation's most trusted brand act in this way. I said in my opening submission in November 2021 that this was all about money for the post office. This is supported by some of the evidence we've heard in phase three. <clears throat> Stephen Grayston, a former post office change manager, gave evidence on the 27th of February. He confirmed that the post office was trading at a loss in 2003 and was in a dire financial situation. He agreed that there was a need to bring in cash. And so you'll recall that such um, references to trading losses were referred to within the impact documentation. Brian Trotter, a post office contract and service manager, told the inquiry on the 2nd of March that he felt like he was under pressure from the post office to recover debt and to gather money. He also confirmed that there were performance related targets. In his evidence on the 3rd of March, Andrew Wynne accepted that there was no incentive within the Chesterfield office to seek out transaction corrections that would have the effect of Paul paying money to sub-postmasters. And Richard Roll told the inquiry on the 9th of March that Fujitsu's primary aim was to keep the system running so that it worked and so that Fujitsu didn't suffer any penalties. Now, Mr. Roll also told the inquiry and he said it was widely accepted within Fujitsu that the Horizon system was poor. He, of course, used more colorful language and that software issues were encountered on a weekly basis. He said that the system needed rewriting. Now, we've heard from Mr. Mick Peach very recently about that, and Mr. Peach disputes that. Mr. Roll recalled that he was told by Mr. Peach that um, this could not happen, the rewriting could not happen due to a lack of money or resources. The post office needed money to recover from the financial losses, partly no doubt caused in relation to the implementation of the Horizon system, but also to cope with the challenges to its own business model by changes within the marketplace. Fujitsu needed to keep the thing on track to avoid the penalties which they thought and they expected to flow from not having the funds to put right a, substand a substandard product. Now, some of our clients have pointed out that the post office 
didn't seem to have a problem in accessing huge sums to defend proceedings in the group litigation. And they reasonably consider that the funds came from monies that were extracted from themselves. Another client, Shane Johnson, has pointed out that it was always about reputation and securing new reven revenue streams. We invite the inquiry to make a finding that in addition to the financial motivation, one of the reasons why the post office behaved so disgracefully was that it was desperate, desperate to protect the horizon system from criticism, as its failure would be what has in fact happened, a fundamental attack on the integrity of the business, both financially and reputationally. There have always been two scandals here. The first is in relation to the appalling treatment of the sub-postmasters and mistresses, and the second scandal is the, is the cover-up. Phase three has been important because the evidence has demonstrated that the post office pulled out all the stops to blame sub-postmasters for errors in the system, rather than come clean and told the truth. Mrs Chambers told the inquiry on the 3rd of May that she was aware of minuted discussions in which the post office had maintained that they didn't want postmasters to know about particular bugs in the system because they didn't want to give opportunities for fraud if postmasters became aware of certain issues. So again, we see the mindset within the post office that sub-postmasters were all in some way criminally inclined. Mr. Blackburn referred to a February 2007 email chain from Mr. Jenkins in which he was coppered in, where an issue had arisen which affected a possible 570 branches. Relative to reference to that is FUJ. 00121071. In relation to the same incident, an email dated 5th of February uh, on the same relative reference from Dave Hulbert, Mr. Blackburn's line manager at the time, stated, and I quote, the dilemma for Gary is approaching branches is proactive, but opens the risk of litigation in future, i.e. we're telling 570 branches that Horizon may have caused a discrepancy. Low risk, but a risk. Being reactive doesn't feel right, as we've caused the problem for branches, but this may be the right option in this situation. The desire within the post office to cover up was also confirmed in the evidence of Andrew Wynne on the 3rd of March, where he confirmed that the view taken by Paul was that, dis was that disclosure could provide branches with ammunition to blame Horizon for shortfalls in relation to, its to discrepancies. The following exchange, I'll read in a moment, between Mr. Beer and Mr. Wynne is relevant to this. Question by Mr. Beer of Mr. Wynne. Question. It was seen in the light of, we can't disclose material that might undermine our system, even if in fact, even if the system is in fact faulty. Mr. Wynne replied, yes, I think that's probably a fair summation. The extent of the duplicity at the post office is demonstrated by the 2010 whitewash report of Mr. Rod Ismay, a report which attempted to make the case that all losses were caused by thieving sub-postmasters. And it's important to remember that the report was commissioned essentially as a response to allegations which had been made in Computer Weekly in the preceding year. In that report, Mr. Ismay advised the post office that they should not review the horizon system in light of the reports of bugs, errors and defects for two reasons. Firstly, any review might lead others to think that Poll doubted the robustness of horizon. Secondly, the more sinister reason why Mr. Ismay advised that the issue should not be investigated is because the outcome of any investigation would have to be disclosed in proceedings with the effect that prosecutions might have to be stayed. In other words, Mr. Ismay was sufficiently aware of the difficulties in relation to criminal proceedings that documents that might exist within the post office might have to be disclosed if it led to certain issues coming to light. Therefore, well, let's not do them. Let's not investigate. Let's not have to worry about disclosure of that paperwork. So 
So you may recall that I took Mr. Ismay after a brief discussion with him about his uh, whitewash report to the, the document, which I'm going to ask to go on the screen, please, which is in relation to the receipts payments mismatch bug. The document reference is FUJ 00081584. I'm very grateful. And hopefully we should be at page two. And at the bottom of page two, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, we, at the bottom of page two, we have reference to impact. I asked Mr. Wismay to consider the uh, bullet points under the heading impact, which meant that the bug, the mismatch bug, caused uh, the branch to appear to have balance, where in fact they could have a loss or a gain. Our accounting systems will be out of sync with what is recorded at the branch. If widely known, could cause a loss of confidence in the horizon system by branches, a potential impact upon ongoing legal cases where branches are disputing the integrity of Horizon data, and it could provide branches ammunition to blame Horizon for future discrepancies. The actual impact of the mismatch bug meant that the integrity of the branch data was affected without branch or sub-postmaster mistress knowledge. The truth is that the impact to the post office was that the secret of bugs might get out and at all costs, that must not be allowed to happen. To any honest organisation prepared to face up to its own errors, the shockwave generated by the mismatch bug should have been immediate and devastating. Instead, the answer was to choose one of three ways of trying to ensure containment. And this is shown at page three of the document <coughs> under the heading Proposals for Affected Branches. On the screen at page three, we have solution one. Alter the horizon branch figure at the counter to show the discrepancy. Fujitsu would have to manually write an entry to the local branch account. Impact, when the branch comes to complete next trading period, they would have a discrepancy which they would have to bring to account. The risk there described, this has significant data integrity concerns and could lead to questions of tampering with the branch system and could, get, and could generate questions around how the discrepancy was caused. This solution could have moral implications of post office changing data without informing the branch. Something of an understatement. Solution two. PMBA will journal values from the discrepancy account into the customer account and recover a refund via normal processes. This will need to be supported by an approved poll communication, unlike the branch poll sap remains in balance, albeit with an account, brackets, discrepancies, that should be cleared. Impact of that was described in this way. Post office will be required to explain the reason for a debt recovery refund, even though there is no discrepancy at the branch. Risk could potentially highlight to branches that Horizon could lose data. Solution three. It is decided not to correct the data in the branches, i.e. the post office would prefer to write off the loss. Impact. Post office must absorb circa £20,000 loss. Risk. Huge moral implications to the integrity of the business, as there are agents that were potentially due a cash gain on their system. Well, we suggest, sir, that solutions one and three are little more than proposals to conceal the truth, protect the post office, deceive, court, deceive courts, and commit fraud. Any corporate body will want to protect its reputation and image, but the consideration by both the post office and Fujitsu, because so you'll remember that these were joint discussions, the consideration by both the post office and Fujitsu of these solutions demonstrates how far they had strayed from any honest and lawful approach. We've thought about this. You, you think about what they have put in writing within this documentation. I can only guess what they said in the margins of these meetings. The insight provided by this document is simply astonishing. Far from the picture which the post office seeks to paint now, which is that Fujitsu practiced an operative deception on the post office, which apparently continue, it con continues into this inquiry, the raw truth 
is that the post office planned the heist, gave the orders why Fujitsu brought the shooters to the scene. Another means by which the post office sought to keep the truth from sub-postmasters was by failing to inform them that Fujitsu had accessed their terminals and altered data. It was a feature of the group litigation that both the post office and supporting Fujitsu witnesses initially sought to deny to the court that remote access had been possible. Mrs. Chambers, on the 2nd of May, confirmed she knew of cases where the post office did not tell a sub-postmaster that their financial data had been altered. She said, yes, I think that definitely did happen. Mr. Richard Roll said in his oral evidence that sub-postmasters were sometimes not advised that their data was being corrected. And he was referred to his evidence in the High Court. They had used the term hack in order to describe the way that they'd approach matters and getting into the repost system. He said that in some ways, in some cases, they were simply told, this is sub-postmasters, that an error in their data would be corrected. However, they were not told the underlying reasons for the corrections. They were not told that the action had been taken due to a bug within the Horizon system. Mr. Blackburn from the post office accepted in his evidence on the 28th of February that as a matter of fairness, sub-postmasters should have been told that remote access had been used to insert a transaction. As a result of these actions of the post office, very many sub-postmasters would not have been aware that their financial data had been remotely altered. Neither would they have been aware that the reason for Fujitsu having to access their systems was related to defects in the Horizon system. So we suggest that the evidence has shown that the post office knew all along that the system was not robust and they sought to keep the truth from the victims of their behavior, the sub-postmasters and mistresses. At the close of phase one, I posed the question as to whether we might find within, whether what we might find within phase three was cock up or cook up. My respectful suggestion is there can be no doubt that the answer is cook up. Now I turn to the question of help desk scripts. Can I just ask that the um, document be taken down so I can see Mr. Steen now? I'm very grateful. And so just on timing, I anticipate there'll be another five minutes. Okay. So I turn to the question of help desk scripts and, in essence, what we don't have. Yesterday, Ms. Patrick, in her extremely able cross-examination of Mr. Peach, referred to documents FUJ 00152299 and FUJ 00080098. And you, sir, will recall the questions being asked that refer to inappropriate calls being made and being routed back to the um, post office help desk. Now, we've been reflecting upon uh, those points because we knew we were going to refer to the question of help desk scripts. It is undoubtedly correct that now knowing that the Fujitsu system had an embedded part of its protocol, which is to refer back to in a circular way to the post office help deck, that that yet again supports what we have been trying to get, the, trying to seek through this inquiry, which is disclosure of help desk scripts. It cannot be a coincidence that so many sub postmasters and mistresses were told the same thing over and over again by the helpline. 43 of our clients were told by the helpline that they had no option other than to pay the shortfall. 49 of our clients were told by helpline staff that they were the only sub-postmasters who were experiencing shortfalls. 35 of our clients were expressly told by helpline staff that they were contractually liable for the shortfalls. There can be no doubt scripts existed. A number of the witnesses in phase three have admitted in evidence that helpline staff work from scripts. And it has now reached the stage whereby Mr. Beer, on behalf of this inquiry, has joined in our quest to ask witnesses, where are the scripts? How are they saved? Who is responsible for them? Where can we find them? Because we are not getting any body or any substantial number of scripts through the disclosure process. 
That, as far as we can tell, and we reassure ourselves, is nothing to do with this inquiry. It is to do with in the disclosure by both Fujitsu and the Post Office of scripts, which we suggest they must have. Mr. Parker, Stephen Parker, in response to questions from Mr. Beer, told the inquiry on the 10th of May that he saw some of the scripts and they were compiled by senior technicians within Fujitsu. In fact, sir, we have disclosed very few scripts. It is inconceivable that the vast majority of these scripts have disappeared from two companies who both operated helplines. On behalf of our client group, How & Co have been calling for disclosure of the script since November of 2022. And it is a matter of real concern to our clients that virtually no disclosure of scripts have been forthcoming. One of our clients, the name in fact has been anonymized, says that the continuing failure to disclose is underhand and shows that things are still being hidden by the post office in Fujitsu. We ask that the inquiry use all the powers at its disposal under sections 21 and 35 of the Inquiries Act 2005 to require the post office and Fujitsu to disclose this material or face the consequences of, no, of non-disclosure. Now that may mean, once scripts have been identified and disclosed, that we may request that some of the phase three witnesses be recalled. I now very briefly turn to looking forward to um, the evidence in phase four. Uh, before I do, may I sincerely thank the inquiry, the inquiry team, and all of the member, members of the inquiry team that sit behind my learned friends who ask these questions, that have been spending so many very, so very many hours working hard to present the evidence that has been provided uh, with such expertise before this inquiry. We ask that the inquiry should have the forefront of its considerations within phase four that one of the core requirements of the system was for data produced by Horizon to be available and sufficient to support investigations and prosecutions. And so we, we've looked at many a time the contractual uh, requirement in that regard. One example of that is within FUJ uh, 00, um, I think 6087 under prosecution support. Clearly we say Horizon was not capable of supporting prosecutions or civil actions as both the post office and Fujitsu well knew. The system had failed in one of its core objectives. And this placed Paul in a dilemma. And so you'll recall the questions I asked of Mr. Peach yesterday. Well, why was it you were not aware of the contractual requirement? Uh, well, all he could do was refer it to his many managerial staff and say that, well, they should have brought it to him because he recognized it's important. Now, the post office had two options. Option A was to come clean and disclose problems with Horizon to the sub-postmasters and the courts. Option B was to continue to pursue sub-postmasters for alleged shortfalls and bring abusive prosecutions based upon the fiction that the system was robust. Perverting the course of justice is what that is. It was unthinkable to the post office that the truth should come out. The truth being that the Horizon system was incapable of supporting a prosecution or a civil claim. And we must remember that the post office had other dependent contracts with other companies, such as the Bank of Ireland, that might well have been affected. This impacted on the post office's approach to disclosure in criminal and civil cases against sub postmasters. Full disclosure was never an option in these cases. But there was also the post office's internal belief that sub-postmasters were fundamentally dishonest. This created a double whammy of paranoia within the post office. They backed themselves into a corner. We suggest that there has been a continuing failure of disclosure into this inquiry. We've cited one example in relation to scripts. We suggest that the post office does not want the full truth to come out. And as we all know, one of the reasons we're here today is because the post office decided not to be open and honest and chose the second option, option B, to continue to prosecute sub-postmasters, to abuse the process of the courts. Our clients welcome the following phases of this inquiry and have asked that, they, that we convey the wish to this inquiry 
but it continues to focus on identifying and calling to account the individuals who were responsible for this scandal, as well as the institution itself. We suggest, sir, that lies won't work for the post office anymore. The truth is client is coming out. Our clients are still here, and they intend to have, and they will have, justice. But thank you um, for listening to my closing remarks, and I apologize for going, I think, seven minutes over time. All right, Mrs. Dean. Um, my personal view, but I'm prepared to be persuaded out of it, is that um, we should have more than just a short break. I'm quite prepared to truncate lunch to some extent, but I don't think just having 10 minutes and then carrying on is um, what we should do, since there is, there is at least a possibility, I put it no higher, that the um, time estimates may get longer rather than shorter. Sir, I can't um, speak on behalf of either of my, my friends. They gave estimates, I think, of 15 minutes um, each. I don't know whether that's changed. But, sir, it's um, 20 past one now, maybe um, uh, 10 to 2. Yeah, that's fine. So just to be clear, our, our time estimate was 25 minutes. I'm so uh, sorry. But, but 10 to 2 is absolutely fine for me, sir. All right. When we begin the afternoon session at 10 to 2. Thank you very much, sir.